Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me, Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, to this very important, very important conference. Africa is at the juncture of a game changer, which I am sure that we have developed, but we haven't fully embraced. So this morning, I want to take you in 15 minutes through a short journey that would make you not only appreciate the essence of e-governance, but also its foundations and why it is very central to the things that we'll be doing. Today, I want to see e-revolution, which is the ICT revolution, as the foundation for inclusivity, participation, and accountability. I want to let you be persuaded that the e-revolution is a game changer and that Africa would be the better for it. But let me begin by first telling us the whole essence and the basis of governance. No, no, I don't need that. Thank you. The whole basis and the essence of governance. Um, it's, 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 it's good that we all talk e-governance. Um, we even speak the language of governance. But we need to understand the foundations of governance and why it has become a useful perspective. Let's begin by offering a very broad definition of governance. Governance is, is a concept that refers to the entire process of the business of government, beginning from rules and regulations to procedures to authoritative decisions and to the institutional capacities that define how agencies of government operate in a legitimate manner to produce a common good. That's, if you like, the simplest definition of governance. It describes the entire business of government from rule setting to rule making to policy making and policy implementation and evaluation, monitoring and feedback and adjustments, the kinds of things that will make for a complete process, if you like, an integral process. Sometimes we have sectoral descriptions of governance as political governance, economic governance, financial governance, corporate governance, and so on. Um, you want to give particular attention to aspects of governance, you can do so. But for us in this presentation, we take governance as a state level variable. It's an all inclusive process that actually binds together the state and the citizens. Now this is why in the 1980s, the World Bank and the IMF and development practitioners adopted the framework of governance. This is because governance ties together the elements of government as we traditionally understand it and the non-state sector of citizens. It says you cannot have government run by only those who are in government. They have to engage the non-state actors, the citizens, basically. Why is this necessary? It is necessary because the primary responsibility of the state is the welfare of the citizens. And the only way you can have any assurance or guarantee that the state will do this is when you have instrumentalities and institutions that make it possible for the citizens themselves to be part of the governance grid. So in other words, you cannot have any assurance that government would have a responsibility, even a primary responsibility, for the welfare of its citizens if the citizens themselves cannot hold government to account. If government is to be responsible, it has to be answerable for its activities. It has to be answerable for its actions or for its inactions to the citizens. So it is this intersection between government itself and the citizens that is the foundation of the governance perspective. And I'm suggesting to you that in order for us to understand this, we must operationalize governance as democratic governance. Democratic governance as a more 
a more utilitarian conception of governance in general, tells us that without civic engagement, governance will be meaningless. And it is within this framework that the three pillars of the governance process that I've identified here will take their bearings, namely inclusion, participation, and accountability. Now first, inclusion and inclusivity. Now this really means that you are able to manage diversity. Diversity comes in numerous forms. We have gender, ethnicity, race, generational identities, youth, women, children, girl child, male child, elders, adults. But in addition, we also have groups that are vulnerably marginalized and excluded. Historically, we've had structures that keep these people out of the governance process, or they have been underrepresented. So we have women, for instance, that are underrepresented. Never mind that in countries like South Africa, you had affirmative action policies that would insist that you bring women back on board. But inclusion, as we would find out when we operationalize participation shortly, entails energizing representation and not simply symbolizing it or making it a token. So inclusion means that every person is brought on board and that no segment, no category is excluded. Now, how to ensure this has been a major, major challenge in Africa. The African governance process has had deficits of governance along the lines of exclusion and marginalization. So inclusivity means deliberate acts of bringing everyone back into the governance process and ensuring that whether people are physically challenged or not, they are all able to participate equitably and therefore they have access to social justice. Participation, you all know what participation means. When we're beginning this morning, the compare said to all of us, good morning, and we didn't answer. She says, good morning again, and then we answered. Now we are participating. That's, that's the simplest definition of participation, to be part of a decision-making process, to be part of the governance process. It means that people have systematic ways, institutionalized ways of participating. If we were to ask the question, what is the simplest form of participation that we all know? It's your franchise. The fact that you can vote and be voted for. Yeah, but you know, the governance process entails a great deal of decision making and we must find channels that assure us of participation along those lines. The third pillar, accountability. Governance would be meaningless, inconsequential, if those who hold power and exercise the authority in trust for the rest of us as a people are not answerable to us. That's the ordinary meaning of accountability. Accountability means whether you are in the university or you're in the bank where we all put our money, where we are students, or you are in the ministry as a government official, or you are a tax collector, whatever it is, the position you hold is held in trust for all of us who cannot directly participate. And our participation, therefore, would only become meaningful if you are answerable to us. There has to be a process of answerability, and that's the meaning of accountability. Now, if you roll all of these processes in, you have what is the distinction between good governance and bad governance. Good governance exists when people have the rights and guarantees to participate in the process. Good governance exists when the agencies of government, government institutions, are functional. They, are, they work. Um, in common parlance, we say they are strong institutions rather than weak institutions. But stronger because they proceed on the basis of due process, laid down regulations. So there's very little room for impunity and for corruption. Now, when all of these things are assured and government works well, and government is accountable, then there is good governance. But if people are denied their rights, if institutions are weak and unaccountable, 
if corruption is rife and people are excluded and not included, that makes the likelihood of bad governance very high. Now, so that's the foundation. I want to suggest to us that e-revolution has become a game changer in this whole process. Because if we talk about inclusion and participation and accountability, we have impediments, obstacles that make it impossible for all citizens to participate in the governance process. Even with the best forms of civic engagement, we do not have citizens participating in government the way we would like. We are not able to hold our leaders to account all the time, even in election times, we have delegated authority. So how do we enhance all of these things? This is where e-revolution has come in and made e-governance a game changer. Now how? I'm sure that when you hear game changer, you, you are reminded of uh, the President Donald Trump, who, who likes to identify game changer in every situation. So we have game changers, you know, um, in the industrial revolution. We have game changers in, you know, the revolutions that we have had. And so now in the fourth industrial revolution, the fourth um, um, revolution, we also have a game changer. And that's e-revolution. Now, today, think of the world in which we live and how this e-revolution through ICT has changed our entire world. Only yesterday, we were arriving you know, at the airport in Kigali, and there, e-revolution you know, was manifest. The, the immigration processing you know, has been made ever more efficient. You find it everywhere. If you look at immigration processes across the world, biometrics have become very fundamental to the things that we do. And, and whether we like it or not, all of us now have unique numbers, you know, so that represent us in all the things that we do. In financial transactions, we, we use those digital identities, you know, um, to, to, to communicate. Now think of the things that go on in taxation. Many of us used to be outside of the taxation bracket in the categories. But today, they have captured all of us you know, through, through processes and means that we don't understand. But that's the, the secret of the e-revolution. Now think of unemployment and, and how people are able to, to get all of us together, get our basic data, and set us up for proper engagement. So e-revolution and the ICT has taken over the entire world. And we find them in all the things that are available to us. We have computers. They simplify our processes. They make life a lot easier. We have artificial intelligence. Now, this is the one that is very big, robotics. The things that we cannot understand. I mean, my wife keeps telling me that when she has been in a conversation, you know, sometimes she returns to her phone and she sees that the phone is following those things that came out of the ordinary conversations that she had. This is artificial intelligence. There's an irritating one if you use the iPhone like I do. It says, what do you want me to do? I tell him to shut up. I don't want you to do anything. You, because you complicate my life, isn't it? But quite frankly, we have robotics, we have artificial intelligence, we have all of these things that have changed our entire world. You know, just think of the processes that we all have to adapt to um, today. Now, if those things are working in all other segments, they must work more in government. And the intro that we had, the documentary, has told us areas of efficiency in budgeting, for instance, in monitoring and evaluation. We now have things, we have tools, you know, that make it possible for us to do things. We can archive things, we can document things, we can analyze things without going through the whole laborious process that we had in the past. I'll give you one simple example. A long time ago, in Nigeria where I come from, if you were in primary school, you were taught hundreds, tens, and units. 
hundreds, tens, and units. You never went beyond a few thousands. Now, the first calculators that were manufactured, if you said to the calculator, 100,000 by 100,000, it will return E, error. Yeah, because it cannot do the calculation. But today, if you have several trillions times several trillions in one second, you have a gadget that calculates it for you. So our life is, we don't even have to think on many matters anymore. Um, life is so very easy. If you went to school in those very laborious days, you would have had to go through logarithms. We, we had log books, um, you know, and so this is very old school mathematics and, and so on. Uh, but today, you, you don't need those things anymore. Um, life is so much easier. In government, you have the hardware of e-governance, those processes for taxation, for budgeting, and all of those things um, that would make government processes not only simpler, but also more open and more transparent. Because remember, part of the elements of good governance would be transparency and responsiveness. Now, the e-revolution, ICT enhances that. Many governments now have digital archives where you can go to and find budgets and find basic policies on government and find who is implementing what and find what government is not doing well. You even have percentages. Today, it is possible for civil society to engage parliaments in the budgeting process and, and be part and parcel of decision making, even online. Think of the kinds of things that we are doing here that have online interfaces that would make people participate in what we are doing. This is the hardware, you know, of e-governance. But there's the software of e-governance, and that's the one that concerns ordinary citizens like us. The Internet of Things. Think of the Internet of Things. There is nothing that you want on Earth, including the meaning of your name, your own name, that you would not find on the Internet. I'm sure some of us will be wondering, you mean my name is on the internet? Your name is there. If your name is not there yet, it means that you haven't joined the inclusive arena of governance. And I'm sure that for many of us, if you want to find out who you are, just go on the internet and put your name. There will be some return on you. So it means that you are no longer an anonymous person. So we have a potential game changer that can enhance inclusivity and participation and even accountability by default. Because today, when people go on the internet in their small WhatsApp groups, they're able to engage government and do things that are unbelievable. Think of our young people in various parts of Africa that have engaged the e-revolution the apps, the kinds of things that they develop, the fintech, the creativity, the innovativeness, these things are just simply mind-blowing. Not to mention the way we all now become participants just by owning a phone. If you have a cell phone, or better still, the one they call the smartphone, there's nothing you cannot do. There's no way you cannot get the, 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 the country's capital. Is, is, is closer to you than ever before. You, you, you have information. In fact, you have so much information. You have so much information that you can even afford to be misled and misinformed by fake news. Now, that's something else. But what all of this means is that the boundaries, the obstacles, all of those things are getting reduced. So the more internet connectivity we have, the more inclusive we are, and the more participatory we are, and the more we can hold government potentially to account. You would find that the one area where we have done very well in this regard would be financial inclusivity and economic empowerment, the kinds of things that our financial institutions are doing. Every little way, in many countries now, transactions are cashless. It's possible to be cashless. So like I said earlier, you then have a digital identity and that's all that you need to carry through the processes. So we need to enhance all of these things because they have the potential to make governance come home 
to the ordinary person. So you, you don't need too many things uh, and so on. But you must also identify the dangers that come with this explosion. The, the, the possibility of proxy wars. Many of our countries and societies and communities are at war. War instigated on the internet. Look at how the internet now thinks for us. Many of us don't even have, you know, um, our own views anymore. The only views that are found on the internet and on your WhatsApp platforms and all of those things. But it's the mediacy, it's the mediacy of information that is the game changer. And that's where government itself can reach people without, you know, um, going through the old means, very laborious means of reaching people. Now, what does this mean? It means that if we extend and expand our internet connectivities and build the infrastructure that will give more people access to the internet of things, our governance process itself would be enhanced along the lines of inclusion, of participation, and accountability. But this is where the problem comes. You would have found that in a few African countries, because of this enormous power, and let me tell you about the enormous power. In 1968, a great professor of political science called S.P. Huntington wrote a classic called Political Order in Changing Societies. And he said, it is good to mobilize people and have popular participation in government. But if you don't regulate that popular participation, it can create very serious tensions for government. And the process of managing that tension would become something that would weaken government itself and the structures. So in a few countries in Africa, when they find that there is intense political mobilization, and tempers are rising very much. They shut the internet space, don't you see? So because they recognize the dangers, you know, of, of free will internet access to all citizens. So it means that maybe the time has come for us to think of how to regulate access because power without responsibility is very bad power. There has to be responsibility. People have freedom, but freedom also comes with its own obligations and duties. The main duty being responsibility. Now today when we are inundated with fake news and all of these misleading things that can make government itself an object of ridicule in the face of citizens, we need to have regulatory frameworks. I think that is already happening, not only at the national level, but also at the regional and continental levels. So we need to have codes, especially now that we are going into the arena of artificial intelligence. I hope you know what generative AI can be. Generative AI means that your face can be put on what you are not doing, and it becomes real. Um, so we need codes that would, that would help us regulate these kinds of excesses. To close, my 15 minutes are over. I want to thank you for listening now. But I know that from this place, you would now learn to take your, your world that you hold in your hands, your, your phone, very seriously. It's your tool of engaging government. It's your tool of access to government. It's your tool of access to justice. It's your tool of access to equity. It's your tool of saying never again a government without me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Another warm round of applause.